Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Zach, or Fun Sized. Uh, I tend to go by Fun Sized at HackerCons, but uh, some people still prefer those IRL names. So whichever is more comfortable for you. Um, but welcome to Chip Decapping on a Budget. So I just want to get something kind of out of the way right away. ShmooCon has um, an excellent reputation with um, high quality talks and um, really professional presenters. So I have no idea why they accepted me. Uh, this is a really lowbrow talk. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So it's all contained in the title. The purpose of this talk was to do something that normally costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and to do that on essentially zero dollars. I didn't quite get there. I got down to about $40. So bear with me. So who am I? Why should you care about what I have to say? And how can you trust what I'm saying? By day, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I work for a high reliability defense contractor. Uh, I really enjoy my job. When I'm not working on circuits at work, I am uh, working on random strange projects at home. Uh, I really have trouble focusing on one particular project for too long. So I'm into everything. So uh, things I really enjoy talking about are food, magic, juggling, and uh, scanning electron microscopes, as one does. So please, if you enjoy any of those things, come talk to me. Or check out my uh, Twitter, which we'll, I, I will get to at the end. So what is decapping? So for, as I said, I'm a, an electrical design engineer. So I deal with integrated circuits uh, every day, all day. And so the black ICs, or integrated circuits, that you see on your standard PCB are enclosed by a material. So you know, you got your standard, as you can see here on the screen, you've got your standard black package with leads coming out. Um, why is there that black package? It is to protect the guts of that integrated circuit in such a way that they're protected from dust and contaminants, from oxidation, from vibration, and most commonly from reverse engineering. So that's why you never see, these, these materials are actually made out of uh, an epoxide, and they're never clear because the manufacturer is not trying to, uh, to make it easy for you to see how they did their design on that particular chip. So, if they've gone to all this effort to make it hard to see what's going on inside of the chip, why would we be interested in removing that? So maybe we just want to see what it looks like. Maybe we want to verify that that part is what it actually says that it is. Maybe we want to make sure that we're not receiving counterfeit parts from a supplier. For example, I often work with uh, mil-spec parts. Mil-spec parts are essentially you take the commercial chip you uh, slightly increase the temperature range that that chip can withstand, and then you charge 10 times as much for that chip. It's just normal. Uh, so if you are a chip manufacturer, you can take a whole bunch of the commercial grade chips, don't do anything to the actual product, relabel them as mill standard, and then sell them for much higher uh, income. So as someone who deals with those type of chips a lot, we need to make sure that the product that we are receiving is actually what we paid for. Uh, and then finally, if you work for an IC manufacturer, an ASIC developer, um, or even just someone who's trying to get a leg up on the competition, you might be interested in reverse engineering some of those integrated circuits. So I'm trying to keep this talk fairly low jargon, but there are a few things that I think are useful for you to know if you're interested in this area, because they're terms that will commonly come up that maybe aren't commonly found in um, other areas of expertise. So a wafer is the silicon disk that uh, ICs are printed on. So there is a lengthy process by which integrated circuits are made. And it's fascinating. And it definitely does not fit inside the scope of this talk. So if you're interested in learning more about how transistors are made, I would love for you to buy me a drink, and I'll tell you all about integrated circuit manufacturing. Um, however, uh, 
one of, the, one of the key aspects of that is they take a really large silicon crystal that has been grown and they cut it into these very thin wafers. They then uh, dope those wafers with different materials that give that silicon its different transistor properties so that it can be turned into something that does the computing tasks that we require. And then that wafer is cut into dyes. So a die is just a sliced up wafer into the size of what's going to go in the final IC. And then when someone's talking about the process size, what they are discussing is what is the longitudinal uh, width or height of the, a single transistor on that die. So if you've got 10,000 transistors and you're running a nanometer scale process, you can, you know, and it's a, it's a centimeter long, you can fit that many transistors onto your chip. So earlier we had the picture of the IC that was a flat leaded package. So uh, I think those are much more common in what hobbyist level people are seeing. In cell phones, we're going to a, an even smaller size of packaging like ball grid array. Uh, this is an older style of IC package. It's one that a lot of you will be familiar with from the old school Arduinos. They used this type of leaded frame. So essentially what's going on is uh, these are the pins that you interact with that go down to your board, here and here. In the middle, this is that die that we were talking about. Can you tell how much caffeine I've had from the laser shaking? <laughs> so immediately underneath that is a heat pad, uh, and then all around it is the encapsulation material. So in general, encapsulation materials are made out of epoxide. In fact, I have a whole slide on this. So um, the Usually, 99% uh, of consumer level ICs are epoxide filled with silica or sand. So if you've ever used 5-minute epoxy or JB Weld, it's a very similar material to that. Um, and it is specifically designed, uh, depending on what manufacturer that you are talking about, to have certain properties. Usually those properties are primarily for strength. It's to keep the dye attached to the bond wires, attached to the leads. So this is something uh, actually that I want to go over a little bit more in depth real quick. So there's these uh, bond wires in between the die and the leads. And basically, that's how they take, you can make a die of any size. You can make that die as small as you want, and then you grow it uh, with bond wires to fit a package size of the actual chip that you're going to put on your PCB. This is really important because um, for anybody who has used standard chips, um, like 16-pin uh, uh, sock chips or anything that is designed to go in a 74 series logic, those have been the same shape and size since the 80s. The, the technology for building the silicon inside of that shape has changed drastically, and it's now only about a tenth of the total footprint, whereas before it included about 80% of that footprint. Um, but nobody had to change their board layout because they were still able to make that package size fit. So, all right, we're interested in getting into some of these ICs. So, what do we want to, how, how do we want to go about this process? What are the ways that you can remove the epoxide? As I said before, uh, there are labs all over the world that have been doing this for a long time that cost millions of dollars um, where they have incredibly high precision tools to get into the, the chips themselves. Mechanical removal is the first one that I thought of. So these are, these are basically listed in order of how my brain works, so I'm sorry. But mechanical was the first idea that I had. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I can, I can sand it off, I could use a Dremel, um, again, we're going for low cost, right? What do I have in my apartment? Uh, I was, I started this process about two years ago and I was modeling it after what if I was a broke college student uh, because at the time I was a broke college student. So uh, it worked out really well. And with mechanical removal, the first thing that came to mind was I'm going to get a mill. So I'm going to get a mill and I'm going to um, figure out, I'm going to measure exactly how far down into the chip I can cut. There's a couple of problems with this. So uh, 
process size. So if you recall from my earlier slide, process size is how large the transistors are. It's also a pretty good way of analyzing what the smallest feature you need to look at is. What is the minimum resolution of an om uh, imaging technique that I need to be able to look at the dye that I'm interested in? So if I've got a bunch of transistors that are let's just throw out a random number like 100 micrometers long and maybe they're only 50 micrometers deep, that means I need to have a mill with an accuracy of less than or rather than greater than uh, 50 micrometers. Well, most consumer hobbyist level mills are at about one thou, which is much larger than uh, a micrometer. And a good engineer would remember exactly what that conversion is. Uh, but basically, it's really fucking hard to get the kind of tolerances that you need on a hobby mill. So I, I went and looked at professional mills. So we're already outside of the scope of my project, but hey, what can they do? They still can't get down to the types of resolution that you need to be able to accurately cut away the surface above a die. So it's not the worst idea. In fact, there's some advantages to it. So um, you can basically use mechanical removal for bulk material removal. Let's say you want to get 90% of the way there and then you have some other technique by which you can remove that material over the top of the die. Mills are just fine. You have to know how deep the die is first, which may require either having a secondary chip that you can cut in half and look, or you could use an x-ray to figure out how deep that material runs. There's a lot of ways that you could start to figure that out, but you essentially have to know that knowledge a priori um, when you start cutting into the chip, uh, which is a problem. And if you're, if you're doing this forensically, hopefully you're not doing this on your own budget forensically because that means that um, someone is not paying you enough. But if you're like me and you're just insanely curious about what these ICs look like under the surface, then um, it, I can probably afford to buy two chips. I, I, it's unlikely that I only have exactly one chip in my repertoire. So another option after we've gone past mechanical removal is chemical removal. So this is the one that most people tend to associate when they think of chip decapping, if you've ever looked at it before. So it's fun uh, types of chemicals. So generally, you're going to use sulfur, uh, sulfuric and nitric acid in order to dissolve the epoxide. Uh, sulfuric and nitric acids have really interesting chemical properties in that they attack different types of metals and polymers in interesting ways. And so by using a specific blend of sulfuric and nitric acid, you can actually essentially target the type of epoxide that you want to be able to get into the dye that you're working on. Um, so I thought to myself, how hard could that be? It turns out it's a little bit harder than you think. It's actually not terribly difficult to source sulfuric and nitric acid. Um, uh, I'm already on a bunch of lists, so that's not a problem. But what kind of concentrations do you want? So generally, you're going to want acid concentrations of about 90%. It's actually rather difficult to get acids shipped anywhere, even commercially, uh, in small quantities at 90% concentrations you're generally going to get 60 to 70% concentrations. What's interesting about that is the easiest way to um, concentrate an acid is you boil it. You know? So what happens is the, the water evaporates and you're left with a stronger concentration of acid. One of the downsides to this methodology is that it also releases acid fumes. So if you're going to do this, if you're going to concentrate these acids, and you also have to run them at a fairly high temperature to get a reaction with your epoxide, to get, uh, instead of it taking days, it'll take a few hours, then you need a fume hood, because otherwise you're putting out um, really nasty uh, fumes, and it's not so much that they're toxic as they dissolve the inside of your lungs. So I was doing this in my kitchen, and <laughs> It, it was a little scary. So I had turned on the, the microwave hood. 
and I was running it, and I thought to myself, today is not that day. Like, that's not how I want to go out. So, um, uh, there will be, I actually am working on an open source fume hood design where you should be able to take the components, order them from uh, nationally available suppliers, and put it all together for less than $200. Uh, I will talk about that briefly afterwards. Um, but basically, when I was doing a lot of this initial research, it was like, all right, I either need to buy a fume hood or go find somewhere that is willing to let me do random chip decapping in their lab uh, with no supervision. That didn't happen. You could do it outside as long as you trust the wind. <laughs> so what are the advantages of, of chemical removal? So uh, it leaves the bond wires intact. This is why most people will go with chemical removal because uh, if you want to see how the bond wires are arrayed or what they're made out of or maybe even do crazy things like run the chip while um, it's exposed so that you can see what's going on, you need those bond wires. Uh, also, the exposed die is free of debris. This is a, a major difference between mechanical removal and the, uh, the chemical removal is mechanical removal up until you're basically removing the very top surface of your die, there's going to be an optical layer of epoxide that's in the way. So what a lot of people will do is they'll go do the bulk material removal with the mill. They'll get really close to the top of the die, but not actually touch it. And then they'll use fuming sulfuric and nitric acid together so that they can get the rest of the way and have an optically clear image. Um, so like I said before, this can be kind of a dangerous process. You know, the major downsides are um, that it's, it's very dangerous. It uh, requires a fume hood and a heating plate, neither of which are terribly difficult to source. But it, it means that not everybody has access to those things, right? And what I really was trying to do with this entire project, and this will become uh, more apparent towards the end, was make it so that anybody could do it. Uh, and then it requires some chemistry knowledge, which I don't have. So all of the stuff that I've been telling you about acids and epoxides, I probably made up. Uh, another way that everybody always suggests is, what about a laser cutter? Energized particle removal works just fine, but it basically falls under exactly the same upsides and downsides of mechanical removal, which is it requires expensive tooling, uh, it doesn't get you that close, and if you ever want to use the chip after you've decapped it, uh, there's the potential that when you're lasering onto the top of this thing, it's actually going to blow out portions of your IC. Uh, and that's due to, you know, basically the, the silicon substrate itself has a photoelectric effect. It's like the opposite of how an LED works. And so if you're blasting light into this thing, you can blow out channels on your transistors. So maybe we don't care about that. Maybe we just want to look at it. Let's say that we really don't care how the chip works. We just want to look at it. So this is where the, uh, oh yeah. All right, um, I have a backup plan. I have a video, and as you guys know, videos never work the way they're supposed to. I mean, it's a video of me, so it would not be terribly difficult to act out. Um, it give me just a moment while I find this. Like all good, very prepared presenters, I'm going to look in my downloads folder on f Firefox. This is the money shot, Windows. Come on. True story. I also wouldn't have any self-respect on Linux. Okay, uh, I'm going to continue looking for this video while I continue to talk about what I did. So uh, I actually did go out, and like I said, I was in my kitchen. I had this uh, sulfuric and nitric acid. It was at 
um, concentration and uh, I let it sit there for four hours. I had, I had four chips. Um, because I work in an electrical industry, uh, it made it really easy to um, take home some chips that were no longer being used. So I had essentially 10 samples of a large microcontroller that I could do almost anything that I wanted to with. And um, so I spent a whole day, you know, breathing the fumes and getting into trouble and um, really hoping that uh, lung function wasn't all that terribly critical to uh, life quality. And um, then I put it in this folder. I did. Act it out. So what I finally decided to do, I got, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Like, this is not a proud moment for me. I got angry. And I got angry enough that I was like, I'm getting into one of these ICs, whether they like it or not. So I picked up my blowtorch. <laughs> and I, I legitimately did not think this was going to work, right? So I had just spent the entire day, I had these four different ICs. One of them, my acid mixture dissolved all the metal, but it didn't touch the epoxide at all, which was completely useless. <laughs> I tried um, a really strong base because a lot of uh, solder mask is essentially the very similar material and it didn't work. Um, so finally I just used a blowtorch and I smoked that sucker. I, I lit it up. Uh, the leads went red hot but didn't melt away. The epoxide carbonized. It turned gray and went to ash and then just fell off. So uh, it it all fell out, and I was able to access my, my IC just fine. Yes. So basically what I'm saying is for $40, which is how much it costs to buy a blowtorch at Home Depot, you too can decap ICs. So real quick, I wanted to go over what that looks like. So. Uh, this was the result of that. You can see there's discoloration on the thermal part uh, where the blowtorch uh, totally lit up the IC. In the black canister on my right, uh, the right side of the photo, uh, it is, that's, that's the remaining dyes from a number of microcontrollers that I decapped. Okay, that's cool. I can't see anything. Can you see anything? What does that look like? So. Uh, this is the very first image that I took. Um, this is basically what happens when you move that light all the way to the side. And it gives you all those colors. So this, this was first attempt, guys. This was, you know, $40, and here we are. So if these things are all a mystery to you, that's okay. They were initially a mystery to me too. Um, there's an entire industry about um, building all of that stuff. Uh, and that's, that's a talk for a later time of how to actually interpret what you're seeing. For me, this has started off as more of an art project than anything else. Um, so I'm going to jump to the end here. I, basically, these slides I was talking about microscopes and how to select them. That is really a topic that doesn't fit very well inside of 20 minutes. So uh, these are some images that I wanted to share with you. At the end of this slide deck, which I will release online, there are a bunch of references. Uh, one of the guys that do really, really quality images is Zeptobars. Uh, so Zeptobars use a number of interesting photographic techniques after they do an excellent job decapping chips to get these high resolution images. and uh, you should check them out. So these are not, these, the last three photos were not mine. Um, if you're interested in contacting me, uh, my Twitter handle is also my email, which is also my GitHub. Um, so feel free to take photos of this slide if you want or come talk to me. Um, I have some stuff that I'm doing in the future. Uh, and if we have some time for questions after this, then uh, we, can, we can go over that. 
So uh, that is, that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you very much.